Is it back or did it never leave us to begin with? Whatever the case, the White House today is dealing with this question. Can inflation be brought under control? Today we learn that inflation picked up more than expected and in moments we will ask one of the president's top economists when they might see an end in sight. But first, it is the other issue that will also likely determine the election in November, immigration. There is a new report out today suggesting that President Biden could take action on the southern border in a matter of days. Come on in, I'm Blake Berman. This is The Hill on News Nation. All right, here we are, here we go, hanging out with us today. Chris Steyerwald, host of The Hill Sunday and a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Carly Atchison is the former spokeswoman for the DeSantis campaign. Kirk Bardella is a Democratic strategist and News Nation contributor, already mixing it up with Nick Mulvaney, <laughs> former Trump White House chief of staff, News Nation contributor as well. Hello to you all. Nice to have you all in. Hello. Good to see you in person. We'll geek it up on the economy here in a second. But first, you had predicted this, um, that Joe Biden would have to do something on the border at some time here, Chris, in the upcoming months. Now, Axios is reporting that he plans to issue an executive order to dramatically limit the number of asylum seekers by the end of this month. Yeah, I think the important thing to take away here is that I was right. <laughs> I think that's the thing that Americans need to get, get behind together. No, look, uh, look at what Biden has done to himself on the question of Israel. He has managed to both displease the people who are anti-Israel and the people who are pro-Israel. He didn't pick a lane and he's stuck. On the border, he finds himself in a similar situation. You have persuadable mainstream voters who are furious in these suburbs. We've seen it in special elections. We've seen it over over and over again, that this issue could be fatal to him with persuadable voters. But on the other side, right. he's got his base supporters and progressives in the Democratic Party who don't want to see him do anything because that's why they believe they elected him, which was to roll back the Trump stuff. So he's not allowed to do Trump stuff. So right now he's getting the worst of both worlds. He was eventually going to have to pick one. So, Chris, what, what is happening in the White House? Because that's, that's all predictable. Okay? You can't really sort of change gears like that. You, you're never going to satisfy any, any, everybody. So my question is, what's the dialogue inside the West Wing where they're saying, well, now we need you to do something on the border. We know we said for a long time you can't do anything, so he, but now you can. Here's, here's what Axios reports. We're told there is a fierce debate internally, internally about the legality and politics of a Trump-like lockdown, but Biden, briefed on polls of rising voter anger, wants a dramatic stand. I was just going to say that. I was just going to say this is not this is not real leadership coming from the White House. This is the staffers making this decision. Frankly, there's no leadership. Biden is not in control of the White House. We all know that. And also, know the that. key. What do, you mean, what do you mean by that? I don't know that. I, I don't believe that Biden is is here making these decisions. I on think the he's border? got I, on and on and anything, Who any is? action that he takes. That's a great question. I think the American people deserve to know that. But one thing I want to point out on this: this is a report. I don't believe that actually any action is going to get taken on this. It's yet to be done. And also, as soon as the Democrats, which there have already been Democrats who have said, you're taking a page out of Trump's playbook. Absolutely not. They're going to back off and do nothing as they've done for Chris, over three years. I want Chris to answer Mick's question. I want your thoughts, but you would say what to that? Uh, I would say that the president needs to have a show of force when it comes to his own people. He needs to say, hey, I'm the president of the United States. This is what we're doing. Know your role. Shut your mouth. And if you don't like it, try your hand with the other guy and see how that goes. Get in line, progressives. Read an interview with his campaign manager uh, that she gave to, I think it was the Washington Post or the Times. And basically, she was uh, talking about the wisdom of the members of the squad. She was talking about uh, the need to uh, re-energize uh, minority communities and do all of this other stuff. There's truth in all of that. But the problem that Biden's facing, and we've talked about it before, is he is underwater with the voters who made him president in 2020. And those are a lot of suburbanites. There are a lot of middle and upper middle class folks. And I think what I think the answer to your question, Mick, is that you have a campaign that thinks one way. You have an administration that yeah. thinks there another way. And I think, I think there's conflict. I think that's where it is. And I think, by the way, now that he's floated this balloon, and you mentioned that off air, and I think that's right, I think he has to do it. 
because hmm. he's opened the door that I think I have the ability Second time. To, that's exa- to do what Trump did. If he doesn't do it now, he gets into the debates, he goes in the political cycle, and they say, look, the immigration is still a problem. Why didn't you they do... They played footsie with this ahead of the so state. So we're going we're, we're to talk, we're gonna talk in a second about Donald Trump uh, taking something else off the table, mm. which mm-hmm. was abortion. We'll get there. Is, is this Biden taking immigration in the southern border off the table? I, if, I, if he does it, it's an if. Well, here's... If he doesn't do it, he looks weak, because he's yep. admitted that what Trump did was probably right. If he does it, I'm not sure it happens fast enough to actually make a difference, okay. and it won't impact the outcome of the election. But at least it gives him now. an answer of what have you done. He I've tried. Well, I did that. Yeah, that's, a, that's fair it's enough. After three nothing. years of doing nothing. All Something right. is better than nothing. So, immigration, <laughs> of course, one of the big issues. Then there's this. Is it back, or did it never leave to begin with? New numbers out today show that inflation at, at, two, at 3.5%, rather, year over year. Now, that continued a recent theme of coming in slightly higher than most economists predicted. Donald Trump says it's an ominous ominous warning, while President Biden touted progress. But look, we have dramatically reduced inflation from 9 percent down to close to 3 percent. We're in a situation where we're better situated than than we were when we took office, where inflation was skyrocketing. And we have a plan to deal with it. Biden has totally lost control of inflation. It's back. It's raging back. The number today was very high, very bad. Joining us now is the White House senior advisor, uh, Gene Sperling. He was also, as you might know, the former top economist for both Presidents Obama and President Clinton, one of the most revered uh, economists in Democratic circles. Gene Sperling, nice to have you back on the show again. Uh, Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Inflation. Yeah, of course, inflation. It is sticky, it is persistent, it is still with us. Why? Well, look, we, the global economy has suffered significant inflation everywhere, and the good news was that it has moved in the right direction. Uh, what we wanted to do is keep seeing it come down more. I'd, this was not the report we wanted today, 3.5%. On the other hand, the report the Fed looks at mostly, which is the PCE, uh, that came out most recently had 2.5% and 2.8% for core inflation. We know there are areas where prices are down from dairy to used cars and trucks, but still, I think that it's, you know, I think people are understandably frustrated that there are still prices that even have come down. Groceries were flat two months in a row, but people look and say that's still higher than I remember, you know, several years ago. And we understand that. Um, We do. And that's why we have a full agenda that is not that is about lowering prices for families. If you care about prices, if you care about the cost, then you should have bipartisan support for the president's efforts to lower prescription drug costs, which he's done in Medicare and insulin. He now wants to do that $2,000 out-of-pocket cost for all people. You want to support the construction of 2 million more affordable uh, houses to bring down, uh, uh, to expand supply and bring down costs. You know, you want to support the president as he goes after junk fees and late draft fees and all those things that go out of people's pockets. So, look, we're very pleased that the job the job market continues to be strong. You know, nobody expected to see 300,000 jobs uh, yeah, last I, month, 276 over the last I, three months. Uh, wages are higher than inflation. That's a very important point, but it's a good Yeah, but you know, Gina, now. that's not no, the case for the last three we years, We want to though. see more progress. What's not the case for the last three years? Wa- wages more than inflation. No, I think that definitely in 2022, uh, uh, you know, you had huge global inflation. The fact that it's global, the fact that it's due a lot to the uh, war in Ukraine, uh, uh, to the supply side disruptions, uh, we realize that 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 is not of great comfort to somebody going through the the gas line or going through the grocery line. But the fact is, is that we've also had a very resilient recovery. You have to look at the whole picture. Prices have come down. Not enough. Uh, Costs are coming down in areas where we can have a policy effect. You've got the longest run of unemployment under 4% in 50, 60 years. You have a strong job market. Are things perfect? No. No. 
they are not good enough on the price and the cost side. But, you know, let, let's take a real reasonable look at the entire economy. And we want to appreciate both what's, me, what's going well, what's improved, and what's improved, but it's still not good enough. And that is the area yeah. of prices. Yeah, no, there, there, there's clearly still a story to tell on, on both sides, Gene. Um, real quickly, before I run. Jamie Dimon, head of J.P. Morgan Chase, you know this. He sees as much data, uh, talks to as many folks as anyone there is. Here's what he said in his, in his letter uh, earlier this week. He said, markets seem to be pricing in at a 70 to 80 percent chance of a soft landing, modest growth, along with declining inflation and interest rates. I believe the odds are a lot lower than that. Basically, he is more pessimistic about a quote-unquote soft landing than, than the average person. Is he wrong? Well... You know, I remember about a year ago, there were uh, there were uh, studies saying that economists predicting a 100 percent chance of recession. I mean, do you understand that we averaged two hundred and seventy six thousand jobs over the last three months that we've had unemployment below four yeah, percent right. for, tw- for mm-hmm. over two years in a row? And no, 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 you can't just go. Oh, oh, well, those are amazing jobs numbers and they yeah. and you've seen the strength in the GDP. So I think you see a very resilient recovery. You've seen a lot of jobs and you are now seeing uh, wages rising above inflation. But it's Gene, not good enough because we need to do more to bring costs down. And we that means on the inflation, but it also means on the policy choices yep. that the president is fighting for. And we'd like to see Republicans joining us on. Gene Sperling, we have to leave it there. Again, thank you for joining us. Appreciate the time as always, sir. We hope you come on back. Thank you. Yeah, look, Mick, good on him for saying we, we understand it's not yeah. good enough. Um, and, and right, there, there are two different stories to tell here. But I wonder in an election year, right, and he obviously wants to tout some of what's going on uh, with the Biden agenda. Um, does that sell? If I'm the chief and I just watch that interview and Gene walks off the, 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 the front lawn of the White House, I, I'm congratulating. That's a really good yeah. interview. That, that, that tone is nice. We hear you. We're not, it's not enough. People are suffering. I get it. That's a really good interview. Here's the problem. There's no solutions there. He said something about a bipartisan fix, but most of their fixes involve more government spending. And people could suggest to you that one of the reasons inflation is not going away is that government spending is going up, right? That the, the causes of inflation have not changed. A great interview. It's a good message, but it's only one half of the message. If I'm an American consumer, I'm watching that and going, okay, great, you care about me. What are you doing to fix it? And I didn't hear anything on that. As a Democrat, you would say what? Uh, I would say that I think Mick is right. If you're here in the Beltway, that's a great interview. If you're just an average person, you're, you're, you're sitting there going, what the hell are you talking about? So what do you want Biden to say? Or what do you, what, what do you, want, the, you, know, what do you want the president to say? I want the president. You want him to win re-election. What do you want to hear? I do, but I also think the only way to do that is to level with the American people and say, hey, listen, you're right. Inflation is too high. This is not working. The grocery store prices, which is really what every American feels every day when they go to the store and see, I'm paying $9 for a freaking, you know, for eggs. I'm paying twice as much as I used to have to pay. That's very real. That matters more than almost any policy that we're ever talking about because it hits every American every single day. But how do you fix it? Yeah, I was just about to well, say, I, Mick would say, that, what's that's the, the, same what's the solution? You, gave. you right. care, and I get that. Again, right. great interview from an empathy standpoint, but how do you I fix want to sneak, it? How do you convince me you're fixing it? I want to sneak Carly in here. I think Mick hit on a really important point, and both parties are guilty of this. When you spend and print trillions and trillions of dollars, of course inflation is going to go up. The only way to fix it is to veto some of the spending, and they're having conversations oh, yeah. right now about that's gonna happen. how many trillions of dollars. <laughs> that's right. I know, and that's why I think that uh, politically, I think that this is really important. Democrats want to make this election about the abortion issue. Republicans need to start talking about the economy and don't don't stop talking about the economy. That's how we win in November. I want want your thoughts, and I'm going to show you Donald Trump at Chick-fil-A. Go on. Kurt, I I think perhaps you're suggesting that the president should give an Oval Office address and say that a malaise has fallen over the nation. He's not old enough to remember what that means. You can't can't say, right, Joe Biden's job job is to talk up the economy. Joe Biden's job as president of the United States is to say, if, if everything is on fire and crashing into the ocean, you still say, the fundamentals of the economy are strong. We're doing it, we're doing it, we're doing it, because there's no other thing. You, there's no other thing to say, because the other thing, if he comes out and is like, let me be real with you, this yeah. thing's a disaster, then Donald Trump is like, oh, ho, 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 yeah. ho, ho, they admit it, they admit it, right. so you just got to eat it. All right, speaking of Donald Trump and... Um, 
eating it while campaigning, <laughs> while campaigning in Atlanta, Georgia today. The former president made a surprise stop at a Chick-fil-A to chat with potential voters. Watch. So I don't care what the media tells you, Mr. Uh, Trump. All right, so when you look at that video there, what do you see? All right, now when we talked about this before the show, I said we're going to Chick-fil-A, something didn't register with me because he's not a Chick-fil-A guy, right? He's a okay. McDonald's Burger King kind of guy, not chicken, yes, burgers. But what <laughs> did we see there? We saw milkshakes, and yes, that is Donald Trump's strong suit right there. So, yeah, that was a milkshake stop, not a Chick-fil-A All right, shop. what did you see there, Kurt? I saw someone who looks like he's president of the United States right now. It's like if you were to watch that, you would go, is he currently the president of the United States at this exact moment? Because that's really what it looked like. I totally agree. I mean, look, this is organic. These are people who are coming. He's got star power. This is Trump at his best. And this is one of the reasons I think people continue to support him. This is when he's, like, buying milkshakes for the employees. People love that. It's organic. It's hard to stage that if it's not actually true. The peach milkshake is really, really, (laughs) really good. I don't think he would win the majority of the people who were in that uh, restaurant if, right. you, if, if they cast the votes there. But it's a swing state, and so I hope Georgians like having people come to their restaurants because they're going to get to see Donald Trump and Joe Biden eat a lot of food. <laughs> if, he did, if he did more of that type of stuff versus ranting and rambling for like an hour at a rally saying God knows what, like he would be so much better off. By the way, we just pressed the White House. We'll, we'll get into Donald Trump's issues here coming up. Still to come here on the Hill. How about this question? Should we give a billion dollars to whoever can come up with a vaccine to treat substance substance abuse. Believe it or not, there is a member of Congress who has just introduced a bill with that very premise, and we will speak with him live, plus later in the show, Hot Mike with Mick. You're going to be talking about... Um, uh, Trump, whatever you guys Johnson, want to talk Trump, about. Johnson, I think, right? There's something going on in Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, we got a speaker issue going on. Okay. We've got an article in the Hill from yesterday. We had a bunch of stuff talking. All right, about. cool. And then on the other side of the break, uh, you're going to break down... I was, teeing up the issues that Trump has. Yeah, and for Republicans are grappling with this question about abortion referenda that are coming on the ballot, and they're not just coming on the ballot in states where it's they're out of the running in the presidency, they're coming on the ballot in places that are key battlegrounds. Right. Uh, it's going to change the electorate, and we'll talk about how and All why. All right, Stirewall breaks down other side of the break. You're watching The Hill. Stay with us. Welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. There are new warnings tonight from U.S. intelligence about the possibility of a widening military escalation in the Middle East. Here's a, a report out from Bloomberg. Uh, this headline, quote, U.S. sees a missile strike on Israel by Iran and its proxies as imminent. All right, Mick, former White House chief of staff, if Bloomberg's reporting this, they certainly know about it in the Situation Room and inside the Oval Office. What's it like right now when they believe something that serious, that imminent, uh, could potentially be happening. What's it like prepping the president? How, what's happening inside the White House? This is when you earn your money. I mean, this is why you want the job. This is why you want to be the national security advisor, why you want to be the secretary of state, why you want to be in Washington, D.C. This is 24 hours a day. It's not like someone like, like Jake Sullivan is there for 24 hours a day, right. but somebody is there 24 hours a day, and you will give the president occasional updates. You don't want to get the president deep down in the weeds on a minute-by-minute basis because he's got other things to do, mm-hmm. but this is this is the real stuff, and my guess is... They've got really, really good information. If Bloomberg it has the story, then the White House. One of the great things about working on the White House, Blake, is that you get the very best information available in the entire world. Some of it's even in real time sometimes. Hmm. So, yeah, this is, this, is, this is the real thing. This is more Hollywood than Hollywood. Do you think he's being briefed hour by hour, a handful of times a day? Only if, only if, 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 if circumstances merit it. You would, okay. He'd have a briefing in the morning and a briefing in the afternoon for sure. Okay. Um, but if something happened during the day, you, you want to let the president know that this is going on, and you might have to run in in the middle of another meeting and ask other people to leave to do the briefing. So, yeah, oh, well. it's, it's, it, this is when uh, a White House earns its money. All right. Meantime, former President Donald Trump is in Atlanta today for a fundraiser. He told reporters that he would not back a possible nationwide abortion ban. President Trump, would you sign an abortion ban? 
Now, the former president's comments come after he announced that abortion measures should be determined by the states. That's his position now. And as a court in Arizona ruled that a Civil War era abortion ban is enforceable. So what might this mean for November? Styrol, here to break it all down, Chris. Oh, oh wow. Wow. He's, he's gonna... uh, if Trump's hat gets any bigger, people are going to think he's an Arby's. That thing is huge. <laughs> that thing is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like a Pharrell show. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. All right. So where are voters going to face questions about limitations on abortion or uh, more permissive uh, structures for abortion in their states. Why it's in these states. Look at those states. Caleb, you're so super, giving us this great and groovy graphic. And you can see in those states, Maryland and Florida, it's already on the ballot. We've talked about it in Florida before. In all those other states, there are petition drives and measures going on to try to get it on the ballot. Now, um, why do you care? Who cares? Well, you care if you are deeply connected to this issue and it matters to you. But the other reason you should care is that this changes the electorate. And when I talk about changing the electorate, what I mean is elections aren't about what does everybody think. It's about what do the people who turn out to vote think. And in a presidential election year, about half of the people who are eligible, maybe 60 percent of the people who are eligible to vote participate. So elections are won and lost very much by who shows up and who doesn't show up. So now I want you to look at the 2020 exit polls in Arizona. This is the key state. So if you put it all together, 53% of voters in uh, Arizona in 2020 said that they were more pro-choice than they were pro-life, and it was 53-41 net-net. Okay, so then look at this. Look at see here. In 2022, what were the numbers? Oh, 62 to 35 net-net. So you have a nine-point increase in the percentage of people who are voting pro-choice in Arizona. Why? Why? Well, two reasons, two big reasons. One is it's a different electorate in uh, a a biennial midterm election. Uh, They're more affluent, more likely to be college educated, da-da-da-da-da, more pro-choice, net-net. Now, so that explains some of those nine points. What's the big explanation for those nine points? Roe v. Wade goes down, the Dobbs decision comes in, and some people change their minds, move on that spectrum, But the electorate changes. People who might not otherwise have voted said, I'm going to come out and vote because this matters to me more now. It changes the composition of the electorate. Now look at this. Here are, here's the snapshot of where Arizona was and Arizona is. 2024, that's what the average is right now. You see it there on your screen. Trump's up by four points in our uh, uh, DDHQ averages. 2020 results, close, very close in Arizona. Are there enough, is there enough change in the electorate that could derive from having this on the ballot, especially if there is a, from the 1860s, total ban on abortion uh, that is the alternative? If this gets on the ballot, certainly. So this is hugely consequential for Republicans' hopes to flip Arizona back. Steyerwalt breaks it down. Carly, quickly, before we had to break, you would say? I mean, again... Politically, if we allow, as Republicans, this election to become about abortion and not about the economy, not about the border, I don't know the polling, but I'm sure that immigration is up there in Arizona, it won't be a good night on November. Okay. All right. Meantime, still to come here from the Hill. You know those cherry blossom trees that bring tens of thousands of people to Washington every single year? There they are. They're beautiful. Well, we're actually going to rip some of them out of the ground, believe it or not. But now Japan's leader says his country wants to help fill in the gap. The story behind this tree diplomacy when the hill returns. But first, hot mic with Mick. We now know that Donald Trump and the House Speaker will hold a press conference on Friday. So what's that all about? Hot mic with Mick. Other side of the break. Stay with us. (laughs) All right, welcome back here to the Hill on News Nation. Time now for hot mic with Mick. All right, Mick. Let's start with Mar-a-Lago, where former President Donald Trump 
set to hold a press conference with the House Speaker uh, Mike Johnson later this week. It comes, of course, as some of Trump's closest allies threat to oust Johnson from the House speakership position. What's this all about? Yeah, here's what I'm hearing from the folks on the Hill, is that uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene's motion went over like a you-know-what in church uh, over the, the two-week <laughs> vacation. Okay. And that even the folks who are not real happy with where Mike Johnson is taking this, this conference don't want another speaker fight. And mm -hmm. I think what you're seeing here is, is, is Donald Trump saying, look, if you folks on the Hill screw this up again, it might hurt me. You might not like Mike Johnson, but we're not changing horses between now and November. If you all think that's what this is about? Uh, well, Mike Johnson today just took another beating on the FISA, FISA. court. Yep. And he just came out and told the members of the Republican conference, yep. if you don't pass something here, not only are we going to get jammed by the Senate, I'm going to let the Senate jam us. All right. I, I don't. There are not enough press conferences that mm. Donald Trump can hold with him. That if he is jamming his own members so, on this, hold, stuff but, again, but Feist is interesting because Feist. Hold that. Hold that thought though. Because ah. there was a big defeat for the speaker today. A group of Republicans uh, blocked a procedural vote to reauthorize a key section of FISA. What they're talking they about. Go. It's uh, allows the government to conduct deep state. Deep state, uh, some say, no. uh, surveillance and gather foreign intelligence in the U.S. So these are, uh, this is an intelligence gathering operation. Donald Trump doesn't like it because he says this was used against him. Um, what's what's going on here? FISA is different. FISA it is in its own category. Here's why. FISA is one of those rare things in Washington right now that does not fall neatly into Republican and Democrat camps. I remember sitting on the floor in 2013, 2014, for maybe the only time in my six years in Congress where everyone came to the floor. The, the, it was, the chamber was full, and we actually listened to debate hmm. on both sides of this issue. And there were Republicans on both sides and Democrats on both sides. And when they finally voted, it nearly split both parties right down the middle. Is this Speaker Trump or Speaker, or Speaker Johnson? No, I, I, I think this is, this, is, this is Mike Johnson taking a, a side on this, but I don't think it changes the overall dynamic, which is Donald Trump does not want a Speaker fight right now in the House because yeah. he, he will suffer from it. You think that's what this is all about? Absolutely. I agree 100%. I think more dysfunction in Congress is bad for Donald Trump, and yeah, you can't. Yeah, the last forces. thing that Republicans want, there's no appetite to oust Johnson because what do you do then? And they don't have the answer for that. Maybe one or two of the members want to have the okay. theater again. But he's right. For the first time, the speaker fights could actually blow back on the Republican nominee. Joe uh, Biden is struggling right now. I mean, yeah, we just, I mean, the inflation right. numbers came out. They're bad. He's struggling with my immigration. He doesn't understand his messaging there. Why do the Republicans okay. want to be the star? But, but, but it's not that they want to or that they should. They can't help themselves. It's that they can't help themselves. It's that they can't help themselves. It's like me sure. if you put a Chick-fil-A peach milkshake right in front of me. I shouldn't. <laughs> oh, it's so good. How would I not or do it? Or if Mulvaney writes an op-ed, say, in Let's The say. Hill. Uh, Ooh, oh, he's real one today in The oh. Hill. Yeah, tell me about it. I mean, there's no labels. Uh, no labels uh, pulled the plug on their third-party effort last last week. There's a lot of discussion over why they couldn't find the right candidate. They they weren't well organized. It was only designed to raise money in the first place. I think here's here's what the problem was with no labels. Their premise was wrong. Hmm. The premise was cooked up by a bunch of folks inside the Beltway. Now, granted, they had some good polling data that backed it up that suggested that that maybe there was a a large minority or maybe even a small majority of people who really didn't want Trump versus Biden. That's wrong. Because while they were sitting there looking at their polls, we were actually conducting a poll called the primaries. Mm -hmm. And the Democrats had a chance to replace Joe Biden. Now, granted, it was with some secondary candidates. There's right. no question. The Republicans certainly had some good candidates to replace tr Donald Trump. And the voters spoke and said, you know what? We hear all this discussion about, well, we don't want Trump versus Biden. We want Trump versus Biden. And that was the problem. No labels. Well, they, I mean... One of them. The, the, yes. <laughs> there, 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 were, there, were, there were a plethora, but... I think this is the something else phenomenon, right? So in, uh, in places right. where you can vote for none of the above, people love to vote for none of the above, and no labels is very appealing. And the polling was right. Would people like something other than these two dinosaurs? Yes, of course. Let's get a, an alternative. We'd like to have something else. But you got to win elections. Right. And, that's and, anytime, and every time they put another name next to it, do you want, do you want Joe Biden or Donald Trump or something else? Oh, we want something else. Do you if want Joe picked, Biden or Donald Trump if or, or Joe Manchin? If they'd have picked Mick Mulvaney, <laughs> if they'd have picked Mick Mulvaney, we'd have have a totally different race Hot today. Mike with Mick. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, so how to solve the issue of training and developing enough blue collar workers? It might have to fall on Gen Z. Those those who are basically like, you know, teenagers up to 25 or so. Now, the Manufacturing Institute and Deloitte report that in the next 10 years, some 1.9 million manufacturing jobs are expected to fall short. The reason you might wonder 
workers currently in the trade industry are retiring and others are simply opting out. Tonight, Chris Cuomo will tackle that very issue with Mike Rowe. You have to know the skill to be, you know, you have to understand the craft, but then you have to build the business. And let me tell you something, my buddies who are plumbers, they're not, you know, they may send a team to help me out, but they ain't coming to do it. They're running the business. They learn to trade. They make the business. They're their own boss. That is the American dream. He's right there. He's 100% right. I mean, I think that we have this culture that we have built where everyone is told at a young age, go to high school, get your grades, go to college, do this certain path. And I think that there should be more of an emphasis on actually having real skills of, of, of you know, really pushing trade schools and acquiring the skills that we need people to do every day. Anyone who's ever had any work done on their home knows yeah. it is, in, it is in, we, we pay stupid money. Is it to, stupid to have money? Take, I mean, no, it's I mean, kind of what no, it costs it's these worth days. What like, it is. you need a plumber and an it's, electrician. It's, it's worth what it is. It's like, we will pay anything to, to fix the plumbing, fix this thing, fix the gutter, fix the leak, whatever right. it takes. Like, there is a, a need so, for these skills. So here's the, show, show the numbers if we can uh, for Carly. Um, Construction, we must hire 500,000 workers on top of the normal hiring place, uh, normal hiring pace. Plumbers, basically the same number. Hiring expected to grow twice as fast as other jobs for electricians, Carly. Yeah, my generation was sold a complete bill of goods on the four-year university. And so a lot of millennials went into debt. Now they're graduating. I do think, though, part of this is on the universities as well, because the point of universities was to train a workforce. They have failed in that as well. But ultimately, I don't think Gen Z is going to fill this gap. I think AI is going to fill this manufacturing gap. You think that's where it goes? Well, I think we're a lot more replaceable by AI than plumbers plumbers are or electricians are. And uh, if you're a master electrician, Electrician, if you're a master plumber in this uh, great nation of ours, you're going to make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And these are hard jobs to replace by yep. AI. Ours are easy. So we should be much more concerned that AI <laughs> will come for us because anybody can be a talking guy. Right. Max Headroom already did it. Tune in tonight uh, for Trading Up. It is a special edition of Cuomo featuring Mike Rowe in front of a live studio audience. Meet the blue-collar millionaires who found success without, uh, as Carly mentioned, a college degree. That is 8 o'clock Eastern right here on News Nation. Chris and Mike later this evening. But first, uh, and before then, here on the Hill, if someone could create a vaccine to treat substance abuse, would you give them a billion-dollar prize? Sounds like a reasonable idea, right? For one congressman, it is a no-brainer. He just introduced that very bill, and we will speak with him, Dave Schweiker, on the other side of the break. That's when we return here on the Hill. Musk saying AI will be smarter than any one human by the end of next year. Uh, Jamie Dimon tells investors that AI could be as transformative as the steam engine or the internet. They right here? Yes. You think so? Absolutely. You think Elon's right by the end of next year? Yeah. I mean, look how fast all of this is moving. It, like, yes, it will be. I think so, too. I think that... Companies were preparing for remote work and AI pre-pandemic, but the pandemic kind of put the accelerator accelerator on that. And so now the future of work is not coming. It's here, and it does include AI. AI, Chris, sorry, Walt, forget about it. I I, I get the part about how it's the next sort of big thing. It was the printing press and the Internet. Mm -hmm. That I get. I don't understand this part about smarter than a human because I haven't seen AI be creative yet. Yeah, it won't be wiser, won't be more creative AI is going to make everything a lot cheaper. The, right. the, the, it's going to drive costs down on a number of things. It would, it's going to be like we're sitting on an ocean of oil. We're, Saudi, we're going to be the Saudi Arabia of data. Everything is going to get a lot cheaper. And one of the big struggles that Americans are going to have, and I think this was good with talking about the micro piece with uh, Brother Cuomo tonight, Mm -hmm. is the quest for meaning, the quest for belonging, the quest for purpose in our lives is going to get more significant because technology is going to keep making things cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. All right. Well, meantime, over the last year, more than 73,000 people have died from opioids. But could vaccines potentially help solve this crisis and others. That's what one lawmaker is hoping to find out. Congressman David Schweikert, the Republican congressman from Arizona, introduced what is called the Substance Therapy Designation Act, which encourages the development of vaccines to prevent, treat, or mitigate opioid, cocaine, meth, or alcohol use. Now, here's part of the bill. A billion-dollar cash prize would be awarded to the first 
whoever can approve, get that vaccine approved uh, by the government uh, for effective drug use. Joining us now is the congressman from Arizona, Congressman Schweiker. Thanks for being with us here on the Hill. I think I got, got most of that right, Congressman. Explain what you're trying to do. Yeah. Look, um, the reality of it is these, particularly fentanyl, the new synthetic opioids, are just destructive in what they do to the brain. Um, we were never prepared as a society for particularly the synthetics. And it turns out we've been tracking now for a couple of years researchers uh, from different labs and different, even different countries who actually are learning how to do types of receptor blockers. The, the cocaine and those actually have different mechanisms. They're, they're more of a protein binder. But the concept of giving those who deal with drug treatment a new tool um, something that actually may block the receptors when you have how many, you know, as you were saying, 70,000, I've seen numbers even higher, of our brothers and sisters we're losing every year to these narcotics. Um, I, I will argue doing something like this is moral and it's really right. smart economics. Yeah, so, and speaking of economics, um, the, the billion dollar prize. I don't know if prize is the right word. I guess I guess maybe so. It's basically the incentive, a billion dollar incentive yeah. to say, you know what, if you're the first to do this, this is this is what you get. How'd you come up with that? And do do you think we'll see more of um, you know more incentives like this in, in the future for other yeah. legislation? I, I'm a big I'm a big fan of sort of that X Prize concept of I love competition. I want to see the really smart people out there be honed in and saying, we are going to be the first one to deliver. Because if you're losing how many Americans every single day, what does six months mean? And that's also why a substantial portion of the bill also is changing the priorities at the FDA to move up a solution like this much faster. It, it, look, we're talking people's lives here, let alone the, the, the random, you know, the police officer that comes in contact with a synthetic opioid and it, it, is, it is all of a sudden that police officer's life is in danger. That there's more use cases here. Right. It's just the right, smart, moral, and it's, you know, we've been working so on do you the have bipartisan support? Do, it, do you have bipartisan support, Congressman? And have you talked to the speaker about the, this? Yeah, we're actually running up and down. Matter of fact, just as we're doing this television hit, I'm now racing to um, a Democrat office to actually do a presentation to their staff. We're actually trying to sell this concept that, as you were talking about AI earlier, technology doesn't have to be dystopian. In many ways, it could actually be part of our formula of how we help our brothers and sisters. All right, Congressman Schweiker, we got to leave it there. Thanks for being with us here on the Hill. If there's an update, uh, let us know. Please come on back. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, you got it. <laughs> uh, so it's it's obviously catchy, right? Like if we can do this, this which would be huge for society yeah. and yeah. for families, and no matter where you are, you get this billion dollar prize. I, I, I wonder if David's one of the most creative thinkers. Yeah, you can on tell there. He just is one of the most intellectual guys, but also very creative. And he's realized something important, which is a billion dollars is really not a lot of money to the federal government. But it's, a ra it's a rounding error. That's exactly yeah. right. And the amount of money you can save if this is actually successful is a hundred times that, if not more. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's I, 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 Take my hat off to him. It's a great yeah. idea. And I think it's worth pointing out for anyone watching, think, getting sticker shot, David is one of the most fiscally conservative members you'll <laughs> ever find. He's on the Ways and Means Committee. He was the Maricopa County Treasurer before he came to Congress. He knows numbers better than 99% of members of Congress. So if he is getting behind something that has a $1 billion price tag to it, that's worth examining. Maybe I'm the, the lone wolf here on the panel, but I have a, a concerns about this, actually, sure. that we're replacing substance for another substance, and I don't know kind of what that looks like, if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I also think before we have conversations about giving more power and responsibility to the FDA, he mentioned CDC, who's certainly going to have a hand in all this, there needs to be a reckoning about how COVID was handled. Well, so, so I'd like to see that before other, we start. On the other side, I think that what you're getting to is vaccine hesitancy. Yes, Chris. Yes. 
Uh, one of the big reasons we don't have a lot of the drugs that we should is that the, uh, the process of approval is uh, outrageous. Hmm. And we saw during the pandemic when it was an urgent, and we saw Project Warp Speed, when yep. it was urgent that we get things uh, approved, they got approved. Right. And so I think a, a billion-dollar prize is interesting, but there's more than a billion, a billion, billions and billions of dollars for the company that could come up with a drug right. like this, but in a lot of cases, it's hard to get it through the process. All right. Meantime, earlier today, President Biden announced alongside the Japanese prime minister that Japan will gift another 250 cherry blossom trees here in Washington. Watch. They'll be planted at the Tidal Basin, not far from the Martin Luther King Memorial. And like our friendship, these trees are timeless inspiring and thriving <laughs> they will replace the hundreds being ripped out because they're doing a construction project there why do you have your arm up and you were up in arms there for no, no no but it, it's 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 this the the, the blatant pandering they by the way let me, let me see if i can fit martin luther king into this particular speech i mean that listen it's fine it's not it's harmless okay. but i just i have to laugh that biden wishes he could wear shades every day you know, <laughs> that, <laughs> you know if he could wear the aviators every single day he would this was point earlier about who's in charge at the White House. I just don't think that somebody like that is oh, actually going to I'll, I'll leave you. I'll leave you with final thought here. I thought it was just a fine little, like, you know, presentation. talking about okay. cherry blossoms. Come right. on. Right. They should have rhododendron. Get rid of the cherry blossoms. Bring in good Appalachian <laughs> rhododendron. It would be better. Coming up here on the Hill, could he possibly get enough votes to be an election wild card? A wild card? Cornell West spoke on this network earlier today what he said and what he's talking about with his running mate. Leland Vitter joins us on the other side of the breaks. Stay with us. News Nation Tonight. Is college really worth it? Maybe not. Meet the blue-collar millionaires who have a better idea. A special edition of Cuomo, trading up with guest Mike Rowe. Tonight, 8, 7 central, only on News Nation. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. So the independent presidential candidate, Cornell West, has chosen a running mate. It is Melina Abdullah, a founding member of the Black Lives Matter movement and a professor at California State University. She has never run for political office before, but West needs to pick a vice presidential candidate to get ballot access in a number of states. Leland Vitter, host of On Balance. Hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> Cornell West. Yes, um, We're talking about Cornell West. You know, I know you don't think we should be not don't think we should be talking about Cornell West, but if I just pull, think it makes us the only ones. If he pulls half of half of a percent, that could be a big deal. This this is the big issue, and I was gonna not to sort of make sort of too much fun of this, right. but when you're talking about Georgia, you're talking yeah. about Pennsylvania, you're talking about Michigan, yeah. um, states where the African American vote is already very much in play for Joe Biden and has some potential difficulties for Joe Biden, picking a BLM organizer yeah. uh, starts to peel at least some of those activist votes away. And what, I think it was 10,000 votes in Michigan in 2016? The Clinton That's campaign, Clinton campaign uh, blamed Jill Stein uh, because right. of what happened in 2016. Exactly. Geraldo coming up on your show tonight? Yes. Cornell West will not come up. You're not having Cornell no. West? 